Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all those join, joining us online today and to those who will be watching this in the days to come. Welcome to this Harvest Plus webinar introduce, introducing the second version of our flagship tool, Biofortification Priority Index. This is Ekim Birol, Director of Impact and Strategy at Harvest Plus. And this is the outline of our presentation today. I'm going to give you a brief overview of what biofortification is and then some background on the origins, use and usefulness of the biofortification priority index. And then my colleague Dorian Altera Marfo, Head of Knowledge Management at Harvest Plus, will present the methodology behind the biofortification priority index. And she's going to introduce the new tool highlighting what is new ending up with a demo on this tool. If you have any questions, um, please type them throughout the presentation. We'll be monitoring them, and we're going to answer them at the end of our presentation. If we don't get to your question in the allotted time of one hour, we'll, we'll make sure to publish the answers on our website, where we're also going to be uploading the webinar recording. Okay. Thank you very much. So as I'm sure many of you online and listening to this know, micronutrient malnutrition is one of the three forms of malnutrition, the others being overweight obesity and undernutrition. Also known as hidden hunger, as its effects are not always visible to the naked eye, it mainly stems from not having sufficient minerals and vitamins in one's diet. It is estimated that 2 billion people suffer from at least one form of micronutrient deficiency. And according to our calculations, 2.5 billion people, that is one in three people, are at risk of hidden hunger. Hidden hunger not only reduces the productivity for the health and enhances the productivity of adults, but also reduces household income as well as country income. GDP. But what's probably most important is that inhibits, it inhibits children's, children from reaching their full growth and development potential, trapping generations into a vicious cycle of poverty. I'm sure several of you have already seen the scan of the brains, which was presented um, by several leaders from the former president of the World Bank um, to the prime minister of Pakistan highlighting the importance in investing in nutrition of children so that children can meet their full potential and capitalize on the jobs of the future, which are mainly going to be more technical and artificial intelligence focused. A balanced, uh, diverse diet as gender and age and activity appropriate is of course, of course the ideal, but most of the time food systems don't offer such diets. And, uh, and it might not be possible to get all the micronutrients in one's diet in the short run through the food systems. So in the absence of this, there are several interventions and innovations helping fill this nutrient gap. Fortification of processed staple foods and supplementation for groups that are most in need, such as children under five and pregnant women, or of course, very cost-effective interventions and continue to be cost-effective. And added to this tool set is biofortification, um, which is a promising intervention which targets staples crops that rural households produce and consume in significant quantities. For those of you who might not be familiar with biofortification, um, it is a process of increasing the density of vitamins and minerals in a crop through plant breeding and agronomic practices so that the biofortified crops when consumed regularly will generate measurable improvement in vitamin and mineral nutritional status. As a global leader in biofortification and technology, Harvest Plus embarked upon this journey about 15 years ago with three key questions. The first one is, can conventional breeding add extra nutrients in the crops without reducing yields? The second question is, when consumed, can the increase make a significant impact on human nutrition? 
And the last one is, are farmers willing to grow and are consumers willing to be biofortified crops? Following 15 years of research, we can say that um, uh, the evidence is definitely favorable towards biofortification. Addressing the first question, there are now three, over 300 varieties of 11 staple crops that are biofortified that have been released in 30 countries. And there are over 30 countries that are testing these crops for release in the coming years. The uh, nutrition evidence shows that efficacy studies, also multiple e efficacy studies conducted on iron crops, vitamin A crops, and zinc crops show significant improvements in nutritional deficiency, but also in several health outcomes. For example, efficacy studies on iron beans show that iron beans improve cognitive and physical functions. Efficacy studies on vitamin A crops show significant reduction in diarrhea and improvement in night vision. And recently, consumption of zinc wheat has been shown to improve health outcomes for children and their mothers. So the nutrition evidence is, efficacy evidence is building up and so is affecting this evidence. The final uh, question, are farmers willing to grow and are consumers willing to eat biofortified crops, are answered um, when we are helping to develop the varieties to see what is farmers' feedback in terms of the variety performance and what is consumers' acceptance. But um, as we started delivery in about um, in eight years ago, uh, we've been conducting adoption studies and monitoring surveys that show that that shows significant adoption as well as diffusion rates among beneficiary households. So if you are interested to learn more about the evidence behind biofortification, you can go to our website where we have an evidence document summarizing the key published research, peer-reviewed published research with links to the key papers. So as Harvest Plus, our aim is to have 1 billion people consume biofortified crops by 2030. And um, we hope to achieve this aim through catalyzing of the, the public, the private, the civil society, the international finance institution sectors, um, to catalyze them to make sure they can integrate biofortification in their programs. And this brings about the question of, OK, these excellent technologies out there, and, but where would it make sense to invest in these? Which crops in which countries? And from that question, the Biofortification Priority Index, the BPI came about. It is an index and then a tool developed by Harvest Plus to help identify the biggest bang for the buck investment opportunities in biofortification. Here, the bank is the reduction in micronutrient deficiency. So what BPI does is that it ranks countries in three developing regions of Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, according to a biofortified crop's potential impact for alleviating the micronutrient deficiency for which the biofortified crop was bred to address. So this is a crop-specific index that ranks countries for suitability. The evolution of the BPI is um, the schematic. Um, the idea came about in 2012 when a new region, namely Latin America and the Caribbean region um, program was added to Harvest Plus operations. And we wanted to identify where it would make sense to work in Latin America. At the time, we already had target countries in Africa and Asia selected. Also around the same time, we started talking to World Vision, who was interested in integrating biofortification in their ag programs, and they were asking us where else, other than the countries you're working in, where else would it make sense for us to introduce biofortified crops? So based on this demand, um, we developed the index in 2013 and published the first working paper, and the interactive tool was launched in 27, 2015. In 2017, the paper, the methodology, and the key results were published in Annals of the New York Academy of the Sciences. But until then, um, we have presented the paper in several international and regional conferences and workshops on nutrition, 
and hidden hunger and agriculture and got some very valuable feedback, which helped us revise the methodology and the data in the second version of the index. And we'll be presenting you the tool that we developed based on the new index and the, the new applications of the tool in a few minutes. But before then, um, I wanted to tell you how the BPI has been useful. So internally, we use it a lot, especially when we are working with partners to see what countries we could work in or could encourage them to work in um, when we are fundraising. Our R&D team, um, while developing a target and crop development and release efforts, they work with the CG centers, breeding centers, and they use the tool heavily. And also we use it in our strategic planning when we selected the 30 countries for investment in biofortification and harvest plus as five years strategic plan. BPI was one of the tools we used. And these 30 countries were selected to catalyze scale up of biofortification, as I mentioned, to reach eventually to help reach 1 billion by 2030. There's also been some significant external use by our partners, old and new, as well as with various decision makers and policy makers. Here are some of the examples of the testimonials or quotes from some of the users. For example, Brian Hilton of World Vision for which um, this tool was originally developed a partnership for World Vision, says that it's been a very useful tool to help them make decisions, especially to tackle malnutrition in the poorest countries that they work in. Yeah, Greg Garrett from GAIN, our most recent partner, um, says that this tool also complements GAIN's efforts to for fortification to see how the programs are faring and what is the progress and how we can implement fortification and biofortification in a complementary way. Now we also have really good feedback from the breeders such as Steve Beebe, Bean Breeder from SEAT, and Elizabeth Parks and Peter Koko, Cassava Breeders from IITA, which um, use this tool together with Harvest Plus's R&D team to decide where next, uh, which geographies, agroecologies to breed in the coming years to have the biggest impact. And um, recently, as World Bank strives to introduce nutrition or deliver nutrition outcomes through their ag tech ag interventions, they've been looking at this tool to see what are the low hanging fruits and um, good investment opportunities to to use to, to deliver biofortified foods in, and they look at the BPI for that. So these are some of the examples of how it can be used. The tool has been used and can be used. And now my colleague Dorian is going to explain the methodology and the new version of the tool. Thank you so much, Ekin. And good morning, everyone online. My name is Doreen Asaramarfo, and I am the head of knowledge management here at Harvest Plus. Um, thank you all so much for joining us this morning for this webinar. So the aim today is really to introduce the new BPI tool, but for the benefit of those who may be new to the BPI altogether, we'll quickly review its development or methodology before jumping into the new interactive tool. So. As we all know, interest in biofortification only continues to grow as more evidence is generated on the effectiveness of biofortification. More and more policymakers and stakeholders are interested to know which countries would be most suitable for introduction and or expansion of the various biofortified crops. Back in 2013, when we started thinking more about this, we tried to identify the key criteria that would be needed um, for a country to qualify for investment in biofortification. We identified three main criteria. The first one is that the country has to produce the crop. Secondly, the country has to consume a substantial amount of that crop on a per capita basis from its own production. And third, there has to be evidence that the country's population suffers from a high level of micronutrient deficiency either in vitamin A, iron, or zinc, which are the three micronutrients we focus on um, at the moment for biofortification. So we took these three criteria that we identified and captured them in three sub-indices known as the production index, 
consumption sub-index, and the micronutrient deficiency sub-index. These three were then combined into a crop composite um, index, which we all know today, or which has become known as the biofortification priority index. So just to take a quick look at um, the computation behind it, we'll start with the production sub-index. Essentially, this um, sub-index measures the intensity of crop production by looking at three key variables. First of all, the per, the per capita area harvested to a specific crop or the crop in question, the biofortified crop we're looking at. Secondly, um, the share of cultivated land area that's allocated to the crop in that country. And third, the export share, which is basically a correction factor to determine how much production of that crop actually stays in that country. The formula that we use for that is shown on the right-hand side, um, which we won't go too much into detail on in this webinar. Um, similarly, for the consumption sub-index, we are measuring the magnitude of per capita consumption of the crop, which is supplied by domestic production, using two key variables. Um, the first one being consumption per capita um, per year, so the quantity consumed by an average adult um, each year or in a specific year, and the import share, which is again a correction factor to, to um, account for production that comes from the country. And the formula for that, again, is on your right-hand side, or the right-hand side of that slide. For each of the micronutrients that we focus on, we calculate a specific index related to, to that. So for um, vitamin A, we, we try to measure the extent of deficiency by looking at the proportion of preschool age children that suffer from or are, that are at risk of suffering from um, vitamin A deficiency. We also look at the DALIs, the disability adjusted life years um, lost due to vitamin A deficiency. And the formula for that is shown on the right. For iron, we use a similar approach by um, looking at the proportion of preschool age children that suffer from iron deficiency. And we look at the DALIs that are lost um, due to iron deficiency anemia. For zinc deficiency, we measure um, the extent using the percentage of the population that's at risk of inadequate zinc intake. And we also look at the prevalence of stunting among children under five, um, using the proportion of children under five. So we take these three using the formula, um, the formulas for each that are on the right-hand side to calculate this crop composite index for um, biofortification. We take a geometric mean of the three sub-indices because we, we assume that the three conditions are complementary and that all are necessary for biofortification intervention to make sense. We um, take the geometric mean of the production and consumption sub-indices prior to the overall geometric mean because of the relatively high correlation between these two indicators. So from this formula, we're able to compute um, what we call, we're able to compute a BPI score, which is scaled from a number between zero and 100. So 100 indicates the country that's most suitable for investment in biofortification for that specific crop that we're looking at and zero indicates a country where biofortification would make little sense. From this score, we're able to generate um, a BPI rank for each country, where the country with the highest score receives a rank of one, and the country with the lowest score receives the last rank for in, in that group of countries. From the score, we're also able to compute um, what we call the BPI priority groups. There are five of them. They're quintiles, which represent um, the 20% of the data within, 20% of the countries in each group. So the top 20% are the, con the, the top quintile, the top 20 country, 20% 20 of countries that are suitable for biofortification investment. And 
um, the lowest quintile group represents the countries, the 20% of countries that are most suitable for biofortification, that are not really suitable for biofortification interventions. So um, just to take a quick look at the data behind the BPI, for the production and consumption sub-indices, we source most of them from, or all of them from FAO stats, which is a database that FAO has online, publicly available um, with information or data for all these variables. And for the micronutrient deficiency sub-indices, we um, obtain most of the data from WHO. In some cases where we're not able to get hold of data, where we weren't able to get hold from data from WHO, we turn to the World Bank or UNICEF or other publications that have um, estimated some of the variables or indicators that we're looking at. So that's just a quick look into the um, computation of the BPI. And um, for people who are already familiar with it, um, you'll see some new features in BPI 2.0, which I'll quickly highlight here. Firstly, we've updated all the data for the variables that go into the, the various sub-indices in the, in the index itself. Um, we have added more micronutrient crop combinations. The first version of the BPI had seven. Now we have 11, but you'll see eight in the BPI interactive tool, um, which are the eight crops that we're actively, that have been released um, or we've actively released to date. Um, the new crop being zinc maize, which was released last year. Um, we've also added another country, South Sudan. So now we have a total of 128 countries. Um, at the time that we did the first version of the BPI, South Sudan had just been created. So we didn't, there wasn't um, available data on that country to add to the BPI. Now we have it. And we've also made significant methodological improvements um, to the calculation of the BPI. So um, one of the key ones is the fact that we're now using a three-year average for the uh, production and consumption sub-index variables to smooth out the seasonality and shocks um, that we might see if we take that, the data for that one period of time. Um, we've also made some imputations to specific variables and Caitlin who worked, Caitlin and Keith who worked on the computation of the BPR are here with us. So if there are any questions on some of these methodological parts, they'd be more than happy to um, jump in and explain them further. There were also some um, imputations and triangulation made to try and fill in some of the missing values that we had in the data. And finally, we also have um, a no, no priority category created for countries that received a BPI score of zero. So for our priority groupings, we only have um, countries that have non-zero BPI scores included. So it makes it a little more accurate and, um, yeah. And finally, um, we have taken what uh, most of you might be familiar with, this tool that we created back in 2014, which is available on the Harvest Plus website and the IFPRI website and a few other places. We've taken that and turned it into a brand new website of its own, which we will be demoing in just a few minutes. Um, again, some key features of this new website are the introduction of our new kid on the block, Zinc Maze. And you'll see that in the maps, we now have more information um, when you hover over a country. We now have information on where we've released and the number of varieties that have been released. So we overlaid our data from um, the crop development work in, in, this, new, in, in, the BP, in this new version of the BPS. Um, you can also see at a glance the top countries, the top 20 priority countries. So this is different from the quintile group, but it's just the top 20 ranking countries um, for each crop. And you also have some interesting information about each um, biofortified crop on your right-hand side. 
we have also gone ahead and added um, a whole section on uh, a, a, taking a closer look at what goes inside the BPI, so the sub-indices. We explain the methodology a little bit more and also have maps for each of the sub-indices. And um, we've added weighted versions of the BPI. Now, we've ha we had them before, but we didn't have them in the previous tool. So they've been added here for people who might be interested in the land area weighted version for people who might be interested in maximizing production of a biofortified crop and the population weighted version for people who might be interested in reaching more people or more of the target population with the biofortified crop. And I'll go into that in a little more detail. Um, and in the last tab, we now have a revised or updated dated a braided version of the country pages where you can see information for all of the biofortified crops per country. So without much further ado, let's jump right into the demo. Um, this is the link to the, the BPI website. I believe at this point everyone can see um, the screen which shows the, the BPI website. On the landing page is a quick description of the BPI and at the bottom you can have quicker access to the eight biofortified, biofortified crops um, which, have, which we have maps for. You can also access them here at, in the top tab. Um, in the about page, there's information about how to, information about the methodology behind the BPI, which um, we've touched on briefly. And there's also some information um, on your right hand side with additional resources and so on and so forth. You can here access the um, working paper for the BPI and also the biofortified crop map, which shows where we released crops, which countries we released crops. So again, if you go into the map, um, there we go. it's taking a while to go here, sorry. So if you go into the map, as I mentioned before, if you hover over a country, it gives you a sense of um, our release activity where we've, together with our partners, released the various biofortified varieties. You can also take a look at the top 20 countries for um, each crop. So for iron beans, we see here the top 20 um, countries at a glance immediately. Um, some facts about the crop, about iron beans, it tells us where the breeding center is that's responsible for this crop and the countries where releases have already taken place. Again, you can get that from the map and also just at a quick glance here. Gives you some nutritional benefits and farmer benefits of the crop. And for people who want some evidence on the efficacy of um, the various crops, that's also available here for you to quickly access. So when we move on to the sub-indices, on the landing page, again, is a bit more information about the, the variables that go into the sub-indices for production, consumption, and micronutrient efficiency. And we also have maps for each crop um, for both the production and consumption sub-indices. So here's an example of one with pearl millet showing um, the top, the again, the top producing countries at a quick glance, um, here and some facts about production and consumption of the crop. Um, if you go to the landing page of the weighted BPI, you will see, as I explained before, two versions, two weighted versions of the BPI. Um, and again, the land area weighted version is really good for people who want to verify if it makes sense to invest in a country 
if they want to maximize um, production. And similarly, the population weighted one um, is useful for people or stakeholders who want to reach more of the target population. One quick note here about the weighted and unweighted BPIs. We strongly advise always um, comparing with the unweighted just to make sure you're getting a good picture of what's going on. Um, the, the weighted versions can bias um, prioritization to larger countries. And in some cases, it would not make sense to go there if the crop isn't produced or consumed in sufficient quantity. So just take note of that and make sure to always compare the unweighted with the weighted versions. And finally, we have the crop country crop pages or country pages where you can quickly take a glance at what's going on by country. So again, this button here allows you to toggle between the weighted, the unweighted and the weighted versions of the BPI. And it quickly tells you which crops are fall in the various priority groups and the rankings. And again, the release activity for each crop um, in each country. So that's pretty much a quick overview of the tool and what it can do. Before we jump into um, the questions that are being submitted, any, we'll just go through a few quick scenarios of how to use the tool and when to go to the various um, pages or sources of information. So assume I am the Kenyan Minister of Agriculture. I recently attended an AU ministerial meeting where I heard about a new initiative under the National Agriculture Investment Plans, the Knights, to track progress on incorporation of biofortification initiatives by AU countries. This was my first time hearing of biofortification. I would like to know whether there have been any biofortification bio initiatives or activities in Kenya so far. Have any of the biofortified crops been released? and which biofortified crops can or should Kenya invest in in the future. So for this question, since there's a clear focus on Kenya and what to invest in Kenya, we would naturally go to the country pages, look for Kenya in our menu. And at this point, we're just interested in the unweighted. So we see here that vitamin A maize, iron beans, zinc maize, and vitamin A sweet potato are all top um, priority countries, sorry, top priority biofortified crops for Kenya. And we also see that there have been um, some releases, some varieties released in for sweet potato already and none for the others. So this would be an indication that, you know, the minister could look at vitamin A maize or iron beans or even vitamin A cassava. It ranks 30, but it's, it's still a high priority, relatively speaking. Okay, so our second scenario. I'm the director for food security at the African Development Bank. In a recent policy seminar I attended, there were several discussions about creating an enabling environment for nutrition smart or nutrition sensitive agricultural interventions. Biofortification was highlighted for its potential to improve vitamin A deficiency in Africa. Maize is the most popular crop on the continent, and this could be a viable vehicle to address, to address vitamin A deficiency. We have limited funds at the moment and can only invest in 10 to 12 African countries in the first phase. Which countries should we consider? So for this, we would want to go, since the focus here is on vitamin A maize, we would want to go to the vitamin A maize BPI maps, the original, and check the top 10 to 12 countries. Check the top 10 to 12 countries that can be suitable investments in the first phase. So we have Malawi, Zambia, Angola, Kenya, Benin, Mozambique, Lesotho, Togo, Burkina Faso, Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Tanzania. They would qualify as the top 12 countries for that. 
Our next scenario, I am a nutrition policy officer at UNICEF. A recent tweet I came across from Harvest Plus as part of the Ironworks campaign mentioned a study which highlights the benefits of iron pearl millet and its proven ability to improve cognitive outcomes in adolescent girls in India. I am interested to know, one, which regions suffer the most from iron deficiency, and two, in which countries will we have a great impact when it comes to reaching a greater population of children with iron pearl millet varieties? Okay, so for the first question where we want to find out um, the regions or the countries that suffer the most from iron deficiency, we would go to our sub-index, um, our iron sub-index map. And here clearly shows us that there's a stronger concentration in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, or Africa south of the Sahara. So again, if you hover over the countries here, there's some more information about the uh, country's rank, the priority level, just for this sub-index, and the variables that went into the calculation of that, that specific index. And for the second part of the question, if we want to know where we can reach a larger target population. We would go to the population weighted version of the of iron pearl millet. It's taking a while to load here. Yeah, so we have the population weighted version, which as you can see gives some gives priority to countries in um, North Africa, West and North Africa, and also in Asia, Southeast and South Asia. So again, ideally we always want to compare and make sure that we have, we're, we're making the right decisions based on both the weighted and unweighted versions of the BPI. And we have that here so we can draw a comparison across the two or three versions. <clears throat> Final scenario. I'm the CEO of an up and coming seed company in Asia. I recently attended the India Seed Congress 2019 where I learned about biofortified zinc varieties. I'm based in India but want to invest globally in these nutri nutrient rich rice varieties. Which countries should I look into for commercial production of these varieties to increase my company's profit margin while also improving nutrition outcomes. So again, we would look at um, zinc rice and compare it here across the three and paying specific attention to the land area weighted version of this because the aim is to maximize production. So that's it for our scenarios. That's it for the demo. Um, we will now turn over and see the questions that have come in online and answer them. Thank you so much for all the questions that have come online. Um, some of them, or two of them are about um, the BPI itself and some of them are more about the program and the, the, the technologies. So, We'll try to answer the latter ones, but first focus on the questions related to the BPI. The first question is, why is the work on biofortified potato not mentioned? SIP has been breeding for over 10 years and is about to release its, the first variety. An aid-funded research project will take place on bioavailability soon. Thank you so much, uh, Maria, for this excellent question. As um, Dorian has mentioned, in the tool we have only eight biofortified crops, but the, in the analysis that went into BPI 2.0 and in the working paper that will be published next week, we do have Irish potato. Um, and you can see the BPI rankings for Irish potato in the tool. So it's um, similar to another question that came up yesterday from the industry, from the fertilizer industry asking um, 
with agronomic fortification, we can also improve iodine. Uh, agronomic biofortification, we can also include improve iodine and selenium. Why don't why didn't you do DPI for iodine and selenium? Which is a great question because agronomic biofortification is another way of biofortification, and um, and we will definitely um, look into that in the future as our resources allow. But um, to answer your question, we did do the um, Irish potato. Uh, VPI and um, it's just not in the tool because um, in this first version of 2.0 tool we prioritize the, con the crops that have been um, released and have been delivered or in, in the pipeline to be delivered um, at scale. Anything my colleagues? Okay I hope this answered your question Maria and um, please be on the lookout for the working paper that's coming up. So another question is from uh, Margaret Anderson. She asks, thank you for the excellent overview of this tool. How does, oh, okay, so that's not, I'll come to that, or maybe I'll ask it because I started. How does Harvest Plus work with private seed? Seed does private sector seed multipliers to ensure long-term availability of the biofortified crops on the market. So this is more about our delivery programs than the BPI tool itself. It's a very, very important question, especially for sustainability. So thank you, Margaret, for bringing this up. Um, for, for In countries where seed sectors exist and where they're mature, we do work with the seed companies. Some examples would be the maize companies, seed companies we work with in Zambia, or the permalate seed companies we work with in India. In both of these cases, um, the varieties are hybrid, so there's a big private sector um, present already. So we, where available, we do work very directly with the private sector. and. In several instances, the private sector even took on the R&D of these biofortified crops on, and doing it on their own accord. So um, for such crops, we do expect significant levels of sustainability and commercialization. For other biofortified crops, such as vegetatively propagated crops, um, like um, cassava, they don't lend themselves to private sector um, very easily. So we've been experimenting and testing um, different efforts, different um, tactics or different interventions for trying to create some kind of a profitable market for to sell the seeds of these or the stems or the vines of, of vegetatively propagated crops. Um, both Harvest Plus and SIP have several experiments they've conducted and, and learnings to be shared, but um, some of the crops don't really lend themselves to uh, private sector investment as easily as others. So another question about, oh, okay, so another question, this is really great, is there is often spatial heterogeneity in micronutrient deficiencies within a country. Are there any efforts, possibility of looking sub-nationally, i.e. We want to make sure deficient subsets of the population are actually consuming the crop. Katie Adams, thank you so much for this question. Yes, absolutely, especially for large countries. So we have um, developed subnational um, biofortification priority indices for large countries such as Nigeria, India, China, Brazil, Mexico, Ethiopia, where we see significant heterogeneity, both in consumption and production of different staples and in the micronutrient deficiency. And in the next versions of the BPI, we want to link the subnational BPIs into the global BPI. So they will all be in one place and, and you can do even more, you can work on even more targeted um, biofortification interventions. Do you want to add? No. Okay. Another question about the index is uh, by Katie Seifert. Um, uh, is I'm confused by the unweighted versus weighted version. Could you please explain a bit more? So I'll yeah. so um, I'll give a chance to my colleague. Give a chance to my colleagues to explain a bit more about the the details and how these are um, conducted. Analysis conductors. So I'm Caitlin Harrington, the, the senior research analyst behind the tool, behind the index. Sorry, behind the analysis of the index is going to take this question. Thanks, Caitlin. Yeah. 
Sure, no problem. So I also have my colleague Keith Lavadini here as well, um, and we worked on the tool together, building off the 1.0 version. Um, but to share a bit of the high-level details on the weighted versions, specifically, um, as Doreen mentioned, these tools or these specific indices were developed if donors or stakeholders had specific interest in mind. Um, with the area-weighted um, index, the BPI score is taken, uh, the unweighted BPI score is taken, and then it is um, multiplied by the percentage of land area of the crop in question, let's say maize, in that country in question, let's say Zambia, out of the global, and when we say global, we are meaning the 128 countries included in the analysis, um, land area dedicated to maize. And so it's just um, looking at the absolute land area out of that group. So countries that have larger um, land area dedicated to a crop are prioritized in that regard. On the population weighted index, specifically the target population for biofortification at the time of analysis, which was specifically children under five and women of childbearing age, so it's classified by WHO of 15 to 49 years of age, living in rural areas, um, that same portion uh, or the percentage um, of that population in a country was um, multiplied and scaled by the unweighted version of the BPI to give that in terms of an absolute um, number of target population um, for BPI. As an aside, um, Harvest Plus and biofortification in general has added adolescent girls which um, to the target population, which has extended the age down to 10. Um, so that will be something in a new updated version in years to come that we will also include um, along with other updates as things change. But if you have further questions, we're happy to address them offline as well. So our contact information um, is online, and we're happy to carry on the conversation further if need be. Thank you. Um, I hope that answered the question. There's several other questions coming in, so thank you so much for your interest and questions coming. First, um, I want to quickly address a question by Adalberto. He's asked. They're asking, is iodine be between the priorities for biofortification? And thank you for asking this, and apologies if I can confuse you. Um, as it's not one of the priorities for Harvest Plus, as we're focusing pretty much on um, plant breeding biofortification using um, traditional plant breeding methods or the conventional plant breeding methods. So it's not a Harvest Plus priority. What I mentioned was a private company that worked on fertilizers was inquiring about if we can do the BPI for iodine as well so they can target their private private company can target I guess their marketing efforts in the areas where they know they will have the biggest impact so no iodine is not between the priorities of harvest plus or among the priorities of harvest plus and then another quick answer is um, by dr. Zeshan Hassan they're asking are zinc biofortified wheat varieties being used GMO or not thank you for this excellent question and just want to um, I want to clarify and, and highlight that all of the releases that have been included in the BPI tool, as well as all the releases that have happened globally, are um, are not are, are not GMOs. They are they are bred using conventional plant breeding methods. Um, so several of the countries, almost all of the countries we work in, um, they don't allow releases of GMOs for food anyway. So we're not, none of the varieties that we have and none of the um, seeds that we have delivered are GMO. So thank you for this question. And, okay, so there are some questions that are kind, uh, kind of similar. One of them is, is there a plan to breed biofortified crops with specific quality attributes that would allow farmers to garner a premium for their higher quality. And another question, the first one I guess that had come in was, I have read papers that, by, that report on the cost effectiveness of biofortification. What about the costs and benefits of biofortification, especially to a farmer? Thank you very much. Great questions. Um, probably better be addressed by our R&D team. Um, but We'll try to give it a go. So all the varieties that are 
tested and then released in the target countries are done in consultation with farmers and consumers depending on what it is they want or need in terms of agronomic properties um, as well as consumption properties. Uh, so um, not in none of the releases, um, a, a variety will be released if their yield is significant, is lower significantly or not than the most competitive variety in the market at the time. So in terms of benefits, and well, in terms of benefits, we think the the yield will be as high, if not higher, than the available improved variety in the country. In terms of its um, its other qualities, again, together with farmers. Um, we do try to breed for um, different processing qualities that not, they might be looking for, different taste um, as well as suitability in agroecologies that they work in. Also, breeding takes into consideration the, the changes in the climate and tries to ensure that the, the crops are as climate smart as they can be. So the premise is for biofortified crops to be what we call triple win or win, 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 that they are nutritious, that they are high yielding and that they are climate smart. And in terms of cost of, um, cost of growing biofortified crops, uh, so it depends on the delivery model used, but in none of our delivery programs that we're using are the cost of the seed is more than the cost of the improved seed available in the market. So we expect the cost to be comparable with what they are producing at the moment. And similarly, as we are testing for release with the national agriculture research systems of the countries, um, we we actually evaluate if these crops need more um, inputs such as fertilizer and water and whatnot compared to the, again, the most popular improved variety in the country. So all of these factors are taken into consideration and that's one of the reasons why it takes years for a variety to be released in a country. Anything? Okay, there was a great question about the um, the impact of biofortification on biodiversity? And it's a fantastic question. Thank you, Ashraf, for asking this. So, um, agronomic bio biodiversity is probably the number one main input that goes into biofortified varieties. When biofortification starts, um, the, the process starts, the breeders go through all the gene banks and the CG centers and other, other countries to look for varieties of the crops that have naturally available vitamins or minerals that can be combined with the high yielding varieties we have today to come up with new varieties that are both nutritious as well as as high yielding. So in a way, biofortification is one of the number one users of agriculture biodiversity and it, you know value of something increases as it is used. And we have demonstrated this with um, several papers we've been working on with the crop trust, if you want to look at it, seeing how the, the, gene, the, the genes um, and the biodiversity in the gene banks have been used for breeding these varieties that we have at the moment and how it's going to be, and how they've been used to, to breed the new varieties um, that we now have. Um, we don't expect any um, release, any impact of biofortification or scaling up of biofortification on probably crop species diversity, because um, we're trying to replace the variety, not um, the crop. So for example, we have research that shows that when we delivered orange sweet potato in Uganda, farmers replaced white sweet potato with orange sweet potato. But the area that they have allocated to, for example, leafy greens or other um, vegetables or staples did not change. And that's the promise we're working on, not to re reduce any crop species diversity or any, or any dietary diversity that is on farm or in people's plates. So thank you for that question. Any other questions? Okay, Katie Adams asks, are country-specific data sources, particularly for micronutrient deficiency estimates, documented on the website? Yes, so Caitlin, answer this question. Hey, thanks so much for that question. Um, within the tool, um, I think, and Doreen, please correct me, um, 
the information is available with the data, but I would really um, suggest the working paper when it comes out next week. So um, please stay tuned for that. It does give a very detailed explanation of each specific data source for micronutrient indicators and um, as well as the other data sources. And in times where we had to go to a second source, um, secondary source, as opposed to our primary hopeful source that is also detailed and um, how those decisions were made and so forth. Um, so that information will be detailed in the paper. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we're happy to talk through specific information that you may have questions about. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, there's a few other questions. Some of them are very specific to um, to to nutrition um, to to nutritional impacts such as bio bioaccessibility of iron crops. And um, as I mentioned, uh, we'll get answers to those uh, and have them published online, um, or we'll contact you to to get you the answers. So. For example, a question by Hubtu. Uh, thank you for that question. And uh, it would be great to answer my question, Maria Garrido. Okay. Okay, uh, there's a question by Maria Garrido, and thank you for highlighting your question again. Uh, is asking, do you have information on the costs of implementing this biofortified crops? Um, yes, we do have cost data, um, starting with the, the cost of breeding that has gone at the CG centers, um, all the way to the cost of delivery and cost of marketing and awareness raising and demand creation. Um, and um, we have uh, calculated both cost effectiveness and cost per beneficiary reach of several of our several country programs. Uh, and uh, we would be happy to talk to you more if you're interested. And some of these cost um, papers and cost effectiveness papers are in the in our evidence brief. So thanks for that question. And um, we're looking for other questions. Okay. How can uh, um, Margaret asks? How can we improve on nutrition advocacy on biofortified crops using acceptability data and consumption data, and linking this to improve nutrition status of target uh, groups? Thank you so much, Margaret. That's uh, pretty much what we've been working to show in the last fifteen years. And um, and this data is um, this information is uh, the evidence brief that I showed you. But we also have several policy documents as well as um, policy guides and, and advocacy guides developed by our policy and advocacy teams, um, which we'll be happy to share with you. Um, these policy briefs or, or, or the guidelines um, as well as um, strategies for advocacy and policy, um, we have developed pretty much to to show the overall impact of biofortification from, from uh, acceptance to consumption to nutritional impact um, to, to convince or to, to influence policymakers to include biofortification in their national strategies. And as I might have mentioned, we now have 21 countries globally that have include bio, included biofortification in their national agriculture and nutrition programs. Um, and of course, it's great for biofortification to be in the, these policies, but we also want um, the biofortification to be included in country programs as well. And that level of advocacy is very important. Um, Oh, it's almost time. Is there another? When we do biofortification, what percentage of increase? Um, very quickly, I guess you mean the increase in um, micronutrients the, the delivered by the biofortified crops. It varies from crop to crop and also um, micronutrient to micronutrient. Um, we, for overall, we um, try to provide. 30 to 50 percent of the estimated average requirement of, of target groups as children and their young children, children under five and women of childbearing age um, through the main staple that they eat. Um, and the time is up. Okay. Um, 
I, okay, I think the top is left for those Okay, for, for those of you whose um, questions we haven't, um, we didn't have time to address, um, we'll post the answers on our website um, with the recording in the coming days. But thank you all so much. The time is up, so we have to leave the go to webinar now. Thank you all so much, and many thanks to my teammates and um, to Harvest Plus's communications team for, for all their help and support. Okay, thank you very much. Have a nice rest of your day.